I've got a, just a, a couple of questions for you, but the, the, the first um, set of questions really needs to be put in, in context. Uh, what you've given to us is uh, a, a clear understanding that when you came in 2013 to the, the uh, trusts, uh, the trust and the fund, foundation, um, this was the position that, so far as McFarlane was concerned, there had been complaints from beneficiaries about the communications and the way that the staff had communicated with them. You had trustees threatening to resign and clearly very unhappy about funding uh, and in disagreement amongst themselves of a pretty uh, dramatic sort. You yourself identified significant failings, that's the description you used, in the way in which regular pay had been made, especially to widows. You couldn't do what you wanted because of the staffing cap. The partnership group hadn't been operating. When it did, uh, you knew from what you were told that it operated on a rather spasmodic basis, depending upon if anyone could be prepared to chair it. And the chair, um, in this the first example you had was the chair, uh, after a couple of meetings, fell out with with others over the minutes. Uh, the, as far as the Caxton Fund were concerned, the beneficiaries knew they could get grants, but they weren't being told what they could get grants for, um, and they weren't getting regular payments. Uh, and the exceptional circumstances criterion uh, was the sole grant criterion for Caxton, and that's not a grant criterion that found much favour with you. So... You must have wondered, I suspect, what sort of hand uh, you'd been dealt, because I'm sure you didn't necessarily anticipate that that would be the position when you joined. And I, I suspect it didn't get an awful lot better, uh, because in 2015-16 you had the APPG report, which was pretty critical, and after that you knew that the, the writing was on the wall for the organisations that you were chief executive of, and they were duly wound up, uh, very shortly after this inquiry uh, had been announced, I, I think you went on till October of 2018. Um, you did have a success with the lobbying of the department when it came to the changes, proposed changes in, in benefits and payments to the infected. But uh, uh, when you left, did you have any regrets about leaving that organisation in those circumstances? I mean, in, in what sense? Well, did you think when when you had to go finally in October 2018, oh dear, what a pity, or did you think, my goodness, that, that's a bit of a relief? What, for me personally? You personally. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm not sure I thought either of those things. I think, you know, when, when one is, does a job like this, you kind of, you have to, to a certain extent, roll with the punches and you have to adapt to the changing circumstances. And as I said earlier, I felt that we all tried to do the best that we could in the circumstances that were there at the time. And in the, you know, there was a long period of uncertainty, as you've identified, sir, from 2015, where there were talk, there was talk of merger, there was talk of procurement, all kinds of things, you know, were, were, were on the cards for a number of years. Um, and we operated in, you know, we had to carry operating, carry on operating and, you know, providing funding to beneficiaries with all of that external noise, if you like, going on all around us. And in the end, when the decision about procurement was announced, uh, sorry, not the, or the, the decision to, to move to NHS Business Service Authority was announced, we'd been sitting waiting to submit a tender under a, a public procurement exercise. And so the whole time, the ground was kind of shifting around us. And as I say, for us, you know, the important thing was to continue being able to support beneficiaries as much as we could with all that going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, when I came to the end, it was, you know, it was a shame that we hadn't, you know, we, we'd spent a lot of time I believe improving our offering to beneficiaries, even though some some beneficiaries might not have felt that. Um, but certainly, it was a much more efficient organisation 
at the end from what it was when I found it. And that was, you know, you can look back at board papers that show things like turnaround time for grants instead of this situation where, you know, things were taking months and months and months. You know, even com- uh, grants that were being considered by the six weekly grant committee and NWC meetings. You know, I think the turnaround time was, you know, average averaging two weeks at that point. So there were, you know, I believe we had improved the system significantly. At Caxton, we had been able to introduce some form of regular payments, even though it wasn't at the level we had aspired to do. Um, and I think, you know, you, you have to try and continue to do your best, even in situations that aren't optimum. And at the point at which the decision was made that everything was going to be moved to the NHS Business Services Authority, well, from my point of view, it was like, okay, well, that's the decision and and this is at an end and, you know, off I go on and, and do something else. So I'm not sure, you know, in, in your in your question was, you know, did I feel the one thing or the other? I'm not sure it was like that. It was a little bit more pragmatic, I think, by that point. Well, perhaps I can ask it in a, in a different way. Did you did you um, do you look back on your years at the McFarlane Trust, your five and a half or so years, um, and Caxton Fund uh, with the uh, foundation uh, with uh, with uh, affection? I do in many ways. Um, you know, there were lots of there were enormous challenges there, which we've explored over the last couple of days. Um, but in spite of you know the picture that may sort of come through in, in in some of the hearings my team had some really really good relationships with lots of beneficiaries and you know in a, in another time and place I, I would have been able to produce folders showing you all the thank you cards and letters that that people used to receive the flowers the chocolates the Christmas boxes that staff used to get sent from people who were really grateful and appreciative of the support they received sometimes in my view more more grateful than they needed to be because people were just doing their job but it wasn't it wasn't a, it wasn't all negative not by a long way and you know i met some very lovely people both staff trustees um beneficiaries um and you know that's that's all part of you know the the picture that that one one gets throughout one's career, really. So I'm, you know, I'm someone who tries to take the positive out of situations. So you know, I look back, yeah, with with a certain amount of fondness at, at my time, but it wasn't without its challenges, as as we've discussed. Uh, and uh, the the final question is this: um, in uh, one of the earlier documents that we looked at in earlier on today, um, in respect to the Caxton Foundation. There is a, a reference to the vision and strategy uh, mm. which uh, needed to be introduced. What, what, what was your vision and strategy? Oh, I ca- I'm afraid I cannot remember the detail at this point, but it was, it was expressed in the annual accounts. Well, but a vision is, is a vision. I mean, you can't articulate it now? What, what you were trying to, hope, hoping, hoping to achieve, what you, what you saw the future of the Caxton Trust as being? I'm afraid I just can't remember at this stage, sir. Very well. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Richards. Ms. Barlow, do you have anything further that you would wish to add? Uh, No, thank you. Well, it it remains for for me to to thank you. You, You've had particular challenges of timing, and I'm sorry that we've detained you later on uh, in this afternoon than you had uh, anticipated or even wished, Uh, and you've made really very little of a grumble about that, so... So thank you for that. Um, You've given us a a, a good picture of how you did your job as the chief executive of the McFarlane Trust and the Caxton Foundation in the five or so years which ended, uh, as I've said, just as the inquiry began. Um, I I suspect that some of the questions weren't always easy, uh, and I imagine you might be the the first to acknowledge that uh, it's a pity that you had so often no actual recollection or couldn't remember what uh, mm. what the answers might be or what had actually happened or the reasons that the board might have had for, for what they did um, uh, and or why they didn't do what they might have done. Uh, but nonetheless, your evidence has helped us to develop a, a fairly clear picture of a lot uh, of what happened with the McFarlane 
Trust and the Caxton Foundation uh, after 2013 and before uh, ultimately it uh, uh, was morphed into the EIBSS. So thank you for all that. So tomorrow, 10 a.m., the evidence of Mr. Roger Evans. Yes, 10 a.m. tomorrow morning.